This is Twit. Let's talk about kind of the the innate capabilities of of what you're, what we have here. Obviously, we have like this this LED screen with eyes. Are, are other things appearing there uh, throughout the use? I, I guess that's up to the developer, right? Like maybe they can swap out the eyes for something completely different. Could they do telepre true telepresence the way you were talking? Oh, absolutely. Yep. Yeah, pretty much. You know, when we think about the robot now, on one side, it can be, you know, let's let's use the, the iPhone as an example where it can be quite locked down. A lot of things are sandboxed. It's very, it's very safe. That's on one side of the spectrum. On the other side, you can do whatever you want. We're more on that side, mm -hmm. especially now, because we're focusing on develop as, developers as our target customer, not necessarily that end consumer that just wants the robot to do something out of the box. So we're, we're more on that side of expandability. So yeah, exactly. Like things like the face, we have a personality in the robot. You'll be able to create your own personality. Like mm -hmm. I want, I want the personality of uh, Ted from the, the Bear, from mm -hmm. that movie. Like mm -hmm. that's the personality I want in my <laughs> robot. <laughs> and and maybe even throwing uh, different voices in there. Maybe uh, uh, Morgan Freeman. Yeah, uh, exactly. <laughs> Dif different voices, different eyes, and you could put data on there as well. If you're yeah. doing telepresence, you could show the person you're talking to's face. Sure. Yeah, all kinds of different things. Interesting. Uh, how, I mean, obviously the, this has a lot of personality m largely because I think I read something a couple of months ago that was about the difference, you know, the, all the different robots that are out there, uh, and how the shape of the eyes mm -hmm. determines a lot at, based you know, as far as how a user or a person that owns it or interacts with it like how they detect whether a robot is is mean or or very personable or blank what whatever the case may be how what what, what are your thoughts on this cuz i imagine a lot of thought went into you know the 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 facial qualities of this robot cuz you want it to not come across as a menacing robot and right Quite frankly, it's it's so cute. Uh, it would be very hard to do that, but I'm sure you put the, the certain type of eyes on there, and it would change the the outlook entirely. Oh, completely, yeah. And it was it's silly how many different iterations we went through on sure. on the eyes and how. <laughs> oh my god, we're just so tired of it. We're like, we're just but we're trying to find, like you said, it's so subtle. Yeah, it is. It's so subtle and talk to a lot of character artists of what features of, of a face or a body convey the most emotion. Mm -hmm. And, and it was interesting. I completely didn't expect this, but one of the, the so the top two were eyebrows right. and the other one was how far you sit forward or back sort of your, which kind of is your stance. And that's not something that I, had even considered before before I started talking to people. So you so and and by that you mean right now the the Misty Two is sitting is standing very vertical. Right. If there was any sort of a lean forward, does that give off a more menacing quality, or what, what is the what is the sense there that someone uh, would detect? Again, I think it's emotion, maybe showing curiosity or oh, sitting back, okay. or you leaning into something, and that's not something that we ended up putting into Misty Two. Um, just because of the sort of technical challenges to, to actuate that. Yeah. Um, yeah certainly thinking that. about that for, for future robots. Having some sort of a rotational, uh, rotational point at the body so it can kind of lean in, but the head can still stay, stay mm -hmm. fixed. Yep. Uh, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about that either. But I mean, when I think about you know, human to human conversation. Like when you're talking to someone and they lean in, you know, that it shows that they're really connected with you and that they're listening and, yep. and, and that they're, they're wanting more. So, I mean, and that, that just illustrates kind of how far we probably have to go with, with robotics to get to that point. And I'm sure once we get there, we start seeing more of, like you said, more humanoid robots because they're really reflecting what humans are used to seeing and yep. makes humans more comfortable. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's cool. Um, so, okay, so we got the screen with the eyes up here, obviously at the very top, uh, we could think of it as a hat or visor, uh, but we have some uh, technology in here. Um, it looks like a couple of cameras, maybe room detection. Talk talk a little bit about what the capabilities of uh, of the visor. 
Yeah, so in the visor, we have a 3D depth sensor. Uh, we were working with a company called Occipital. And, and they have some really good technology on uh, basically generating that map and navigating and, and what we call localization, which is the robot knowing where it is in that space. Mm -hmm. So it's a sensor, so there's uh, basically it, it um, emits like some infrared light and then it detects that light and it can give you a, a basically a, what's called a point cloud. So it's just a lot of points mm -hmm. and the distance to those points. And as the robot moves around, again, it can generate a 3D model of your space. Sure. Is and, it and storing that model? Like the, as, as it wanders through your living room for the hundredth time, yep. at that point, it's already familiar with, with the layout of the room, right? Versus the first time. Or is it just detecting this on the fly no matter what environment it's in? It's a little of both. So it is storing a map of your space because you would want a map for navigation sure. or you want to be able to say, hey, robot, like go to the kitchen or go to the living room. So yeah, it knows where true. those different points mm -hmm. are. And then it can annotate that map with different things that it finds. Or you can manually annotate it. Like you could say, you know, this is my front door so that the robot knows that maybe it should wait there for when you're getting home from work because mm -hmm. you wrote some skill that you you know, tells you something when you get home from work. Um, and then we, we take that data again on the robot itself and, and we abstract it to different ways. So not necessarily just a 3D model, but we give you a, a 2D floor plan of your space. Okay. And then on the other side, it, it is changing the map as things are updated. You move, you know, you reorganize your living room or you move a chair around. Uh, there are things that it's seeing that are that'll update its map with that new information. Right, yeah, your chair's not going to always stay in the same place or the ottoman or whatever. It's, there are things that are fixed, the walls, and you know, r roughly the furniture, but then there are variables within that. Yep, and yeah. then there's also a, a high resolution camera in, the, in, the, in that visor as well. Mm -hmm. And we use that for computer vision, so tracking faces, recognizing your face, so it knows who you are. If you're okay. a new person the robot hasn't seen, um, tracking people so it can follow you around. And, and then again, because we're so open, we, we basically put libraries on there like TensorFlow, sure, which is an open source library for doing um, machine learning training. So you could train your own objects. So you could train it to recognize your, your pet, or maybe you have some object in your house that you want to be important for the robot. You could show it a lot of images of that thing and, and then train the robot on and then you use that within your skill. And that's something that a developer is going to be able to do more than just like a, a, a consumer. Like, like you said, this is really tailored more for developers to get their minds going and get them active. But this isn't the kind of thing where a consumer says, I, I got me a Misty 2 and I trained my dog, the images of my dog. That would have to be a skill that a developer actually created to tap into things like TensorFlow to do that, right? Yep, exactly. And mm -hmm. we're not sure how long it's going to take to get from, you know, it took, it took about, well, it took a while, but it, from when the Apple II came out to when really consumers started buying personal computers, I mean, it was three or four years before there was enough applications out there that it really started to go into that market. Sure. And we're not sure how long that's going to take for, for Misty. Yeah. to get from the developers to then the point when a consumer could say, robots, like, that sounds cool. What are they? What does it do? Oh, here's the hundred different skills that are in the skill store that they can just, you know, sort of one button. Like, I want the, the one to play with my pet, and I want the one to be the security bot, and I want the one to read stories to my kid at bedtime, and things like that. 